So Martin, over okay. to you. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, I think a little bit different, and I hope. Um, during these periods of lockdown we've had, I think I've noted a lot of people have been getting out and about, and there's been a greater interest taken in the countryside and wildlife in general. And I've been aware that on a number of television programmes I've watched, you know, Winter Watch and a few others, um, one thing that comes up quite regularly is um, a concentration on red squirrels um, and, you know, clips of them. And I, I, I'm very aware that here in the Ribble Valley, and I've lived here for 36 years now, I've never seen a red squirrel in the Ribble Valley at all. Um, and I'm sure that probably in the rest of my lifetime, I won't see one. However, not very far from here, there are areas, if you go to them, where you are likely, or there is a chance that you will see, red squirrels, our native British red squirrel, in its natural habitat. Um, one of the areas not too far from here, and I'll just move to one side, is in the uh, Lake District. Um, you might not be able to see that very clearly, but if you go on to speak of you, there's a, a picture of a lovely red squirrel sitting on a branch, and that's, that's a picture I took almost two years ago to, to the day, um, not far from our cottage in Patterdale. That's North, uh, North Lake District. Um, there is actually another one, almost horizontally opposite, on the other side of my head, but it's somewhat hiding behind a branch. And maybe on a couple of occasions a year when we're out walking, we might actually spot reds running around and to me it's an absolute delight to see something that I know that I'll I, I probably, probably can't see everywhere and um, it, it's something that's quite a rarity. Now I think the issue is here when I see them in the Lake District I had thought that was quite natural but have begun to realise that it's only because of some dedicated work by wildlife trusts and volunteer groups that we're actually continuing to see these in this particular area and other areas not very far from us. Um, so what, what I've um, felt is that uh, it might be useful to talk to someone who's involved in this to maybe tell us a little bit about, well, how have we got to this state in this country where we're losing our natural uh, um, mammal, the red squirrel? Um, what, are, what are we doing about to stop the decline any further? And is there any hope of recovering that situation. And I'm very pleased to welcome tonight Emma Duan, who is the Red Squirrel Officer for Lancashire Wildlife Trust. And she covers Lancashire, Greater Manchester and North Merseyside. Previous to her job there, she worked for the RS, RSPCA, uh, so is well versed in wildlife and animals. So uh, um, I think that's probably all I will say apart from now handing over to Emma. Where is she? Oh, I can see our spotter there. And I'll put you on speak of you, Emma. Brilliant, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. There we go. Is that all good? So yeah, thanks for that, Martin. I mean, it would be lovely if we could start seeing reds in our hometowns and in our gardens. I mean, I really hope that will be something in the future. Um, but today I will chat with you about how, how we've come to it, what's happened to reds, and as well what the Merseyside and Lancashire Red School project is doing. Um, so yeah, the project is part of the Wildlife Trust and this is the work that we do um, over in Merseyside. So, uh, red squirrels, I'll start with that. Um, so red squirrels are our only native species of squirrel. Um, they can live in all types of woodland. Um, some people often think that reds can only thrive in conifer habitats, um, but this isn't the case. Their prime habitat, where they can have the highest densities, would be in broadleaf and mixed woodlands. Um, they primarily feed on seeds and nuts, um, but will supplement their diet with fruit, plant shoots and fungi when their preferred food is less readily available. They're active throughout the year and they do not hibernate and a squirrel will build and live in a nest which is called a dray. Um, so this is over here in this corner. Um, it's around the size of a football 
uh, just round ball of twigs from the outside doesn't look like a lot but on the inside this will be lined with mosses grass and leaves so it'll be quite nice and cozy in there for them um, breeding season will start with mating chases in January and um, with the first litters expected to be born in March. Um, females will be able to produce another litter if the conditions are right um, and that would be in July and August but usually it's just in our areas it's usually just one. Um, so the situation in for red squirrels in the UK. Well, in 2020, the Mammal Society released an official red list for British mammals, um, highlighting the species that are most at risk. And included in this, the red squirrel is classified as endangered and is one of the 19 species considered at risk of extinction in Britain. The numbers that we're looking at at the moment, um, the most recent statistics, about 140,000 in the UK as a whole. Um, most of these are in Scotland, or about three quarters of that in Scotland, and only about 15,000 in England. Um, and it's thought that without conservation management, it is predicted that the red squirrel will go extinct within 10 years. So this is something that we could see disappear from our landscape in quite a short time. Um, red squirrels and their resting places receive full protection under the Wildlife and Countryside Act in the UK. Um, so how have we got to these numbers? Well, once red squirrels would have been widespread throughout the UK in all types of woodlands, um, a one-time high is estimated to be 3.5 million. But this was obviously a time when the landscape was very different to what we have now. Um, predators, including domestic cats and dogs, viruses and changes to our landscapes, all pose threats. Um, but the, induction, the introduction of the grey squirrel um, from America in 1876 is the main reason behind such a sharp decline. Um, grey squirrels were introduced as an ornamental species to populate the grounds of stately homes. So people went to America and thought, oh, actually, I'd quite like to see that in my back garden. And unfortunately, these people did not realise the chaos that was about to happen um, when they introduced them to the UK. And there was about a further, they reckon about another 30 separate introductions happened um, until in 1930 when the damage that they were doing was actually recognised. So even back in all that time, they knew these squirrels were having a real effect on the landscape and um, it was then made illegal to release a grey squirrel. And it is till this day, you still cannot release a grey squirrel in the UK. Um, greys, as you can see from this map here, they have like rapidly spread and colonised much of England and Wales. And um, you can literally see them starting out in the south here, and they have just pushed the reds up and away. And we're only like the main strongholds now in Scotland and of course Ireland. But from what it should have been, they have had a massive impact. So what is the issue? Well. Grey squirrels, we've got about 2.5 million in the UK. Um, grey squirrels outcompete reds for food and resources. They are roughly twice as heavy as reds and can tolerate living in much denser populations than reds do. So with greys, you're looking at about 15 individuals per hectare, whereas reds would be about two to three per hectare in mixed and broadleaf woodlands. Um, greys also have a resistance to a chemical called tannin, uh, which is found in seeds such as acorns. Unripened acorns will have high levels of these chemicals, um, but they will still be a high energy food source and reds cannot effectively digest them at this stage. So this means that grey squirrels can decimate crops of acorns before they ripen and become a viable food source for reds. Um, greys will also raid the food stores of reds. Greys have um, a better memory than reds, so they can remember where these food stores are a little bit better. So they've got everything to play for, unfortunately. Um, as greys have a higher daily food requirement, they live in higher densities and can eat food before it comes available to reds. They just monopolise the food sources in our woodlands. This, the effects of this competition on reds can result in reduced fitness of individual red squirrels, reduced fecundity, so 
females won't have the opportunity to be able to breed again in the year, so they'll only breed once. And as well, there's a reduced body growth in juveniles. So this competition is a real stressor on red squirrels. And even at moderate gray squirrel densities, reds are just unable to avoid this competition with them. Now, gray squirrels tend to rely on trees that have got large seeds, which are of a high energy value, like such as oak. Um, whereas red squirrels can feed on smaller seeds, um, for example, coniferous trees, the pines, um, and this is the reason that most of the UK red squirrel populations are restricted to coniferous woodlands because they can survive there, whereas the red, uh, whereas the grey squirrel, sorry, struggles to get a foothold in here. And of course, the most significant threat associated with greys is the spread and transmission of a disease called squirrel pox virus. Um, grey squirrels will not be affected by this disease, but they can be host to high concentrations of the virus and then they can transmit this to reds. Um, studies have found that in some populations of greys, 100% of the individuals will be carrying this virus. And so it can change, it, it differs between populations of greys, how many individuals carry it. The symptoms in reds will show through lesions, ulcers, scabs around the face, feet and genitalia. Um, and infected individuals will die within two weeks. It, usually it's because they've been starving to death as they're unable to feed themselves. It's a really long and drawn out, horrible death. Um, it's kind of similar to myxomatosis in rabbits where they just become unable to do anything for themselves. And in the presence of squirrel pox, research has found that greys will outplay, will replace reds up to 25 times faster than through competition alone. So this really gives them like another advantage. Um, squirrel pox outbreaks in red squirrels do not occur in areas where you don't have greys. So for example, in Northern Scotland, um, outbreaks are linked to those greys coming into red only areas. Um, but once they've come in, red to red transmission can then happen after that. So what are we looking in the north? Well, we've got 17 large conifer forests in northern England that have been designated in 2005 to help provide a focus for red squirrel conservation. Um, as you can see on here, you've got the um, red squirrel reserves are in the darker green and then surrounded by that, you've got a five kilometre buffer zone to help protect um, the reserve from graze. The conservation strategy focuses on protecting reds in these strongholds by controlling the greys in these buffer zones and further. Um, as you can see, Form B is the most southerly out of these reserves, or also quite far from everyone else. Um, we do have the benefit of having a coast as a barrier there, um, so we're just looking at grey intrusion from. Um, and as well, we are one of the remaining urban areas in England where you find red squirrels. So they're quite unique in that aspect, but of course, being an urban area, you also get a few management complications that come with that. Um, so this is Sefton and this, um, these are the woodlands that are within our stronghold. We've got about 142, um, over about 40 different ownerships. So we, we work with a wide variety of landowners. Um, as you can see, the urban environment and as well agriculture as well splits these woodlands. So we end up with quite isolated areas and parts. So of course we've got a fragmented habitat as well because of the landscape uses. Um, so this is what our squirrel distribution looks like. Um, we've got the, the boundary here in purple. Our red only area here is around the conifer forest of Formby. Um, so this is the areas where we usually just have reds and we will get greys popping up there, but these are usually where it's just red only areas. Um, we've got both species occur in these orange areas and greys only in the greys. But as you can see in this kind of map, it just shows there's no like, there's not really a no man's land kind of area. There's no buffer between both of the species so they come into contact um, regularly. So of course with contact between greys and reds comes the risk 
of squirrel pox. Um, unfortunately, within the stronghold in the last 13 years, we've had two squirrel outbreaks. The worst of that was 2008, where our population actually declined by 80%. So unfortunately, greys in the area are a constant battle for us to protect them, protect the reds from them. Um, so yeah, this is where the Merseyside and Lancashire Red Squirrel Project comes in. Um, it was our aim that the red squirrels will once become, uh, will once again become a common sight from North Merseyside, West Lancashire and beyond. Um, we have the longest running red squirrel monitoring programme in the UK um, and as well we coordinate great control in the area and run an urban track loan scheme to overcome the management of urban areas. So our monitoring programme it runs twice a year. Um, in spring, we start in March, so we're about to start this soon. We're preparing for it now. Um, and then later on in autumn, we'll also repeat in October. By looking in spring, we can look at the overwinter survival of the population from the year previous. And in autumn, we can then look at the breeding success of the population as well. And um, we do this through a few methods. We use visual transect, so our volunteers will go out in the woodlands. Um, they'll walk along the transect and they'll record how many squirrels they see within that. We also use hair tubes, so you can identify under a microscope um, a red or a grey hair. Trail cameras as well are really handy to, especially places that we can't monitor or monitor without disturbance. Um, and as well, we get sightings from the public and the rangers ourselves and me when I'm out and about, we'll record them. Um, whenever we calculate population, we use our 2002 as a baseline. So we, we look at our population 2002 as the 100% and then we calculate a popula population index and we're constantly comparing the population to what it was in 2002 to see if it's increased or decreased. So we just had the results of our autumn monitoring and so I'll share them with you. So in 2020, um, as you can see, on the monitoring in the reserve, you can see this crash that we had in 2008, where we reduced massively. You can see it continues to increase with a few drops, and then we have the worst crash in 2019 with um, squirrel pox then as well. Um, but fortunately, with the results of our 2020 monitoring, we have now seen an increase in the population again. So it looks like it's recovering from that 2019 um, outbreak. Um, and last year we had seven reported cases of possible pox um, nothing was confirmed. We have it. If people report dead red squirrels and they see signs of disease on them, we will go and collect them and have them analysed to see if it is pox or some of any other viruses and diseases. Um, but sometimes we just get photographs or members of public have just seen them running around with like possible signs like the start of it and then we can only see it possible, but we will record that. Um, so we gather red sightings um, from the public report them to us, get them from the transects on, um, that our volunteers do and from myself when I'm out and about. So this was from our autumn 2020 report. Um, so you can see our distribution of reds. Um, we know that there are reds in other areas than this, um, but of course, if people don't report, we don't know. So we're encouraging more people to report the red sightings so we can get a better and clearer view of the distribution across the stronghold. But you can see around form being around the reserve is where we're seeing most of our reds. But then of course, we also monitor grey sightings. So these aren't necessarily where we always get greys, but this is where greys have been reported to us. So they may only be one grey. For example, we get greys that appear through form and seem to be travelling through. But this just goes to show you that we are getting reds, uh, we are getting greys in those areas that should be red only. And so that the intrusion, it is a constant threat and it's something that we need to keep on top of because we don't want greys going in these safe areas for our reds because obviously with, with raising these areas comes the risk of squirrel pox. 
So throughout the area, we coordinate grey squirrel control throughout the woodlands of the stronghold. Um, the aims of grey control are to reduce the detrimental effects that competition have on reds and also to reduce the risk of further outbreaks of squirrel pots. Um, our monitoring enables us to identify priori priority areas in the stronghold. So if our monitoring is showing that certain areas, um, we're getting a lot of greys and greys are increasing or if they're appearing in areas where we haven't had them before, we can identify this from monitoring. Um, the urban environment isn't as easy to manage as the landscape is made with individual gardens. So to overcome this, we have an urban trap loan scheme, which is run by our volunteers. So members of public, especially in Formby, may never have seen a grey squirrel in their garden before. There, there are a lot of people in Formby who are very proud and protective of their reds, which is brilliant. So if they spot a grey in their garden, they will get in touch with us straight away. When this happens, if they may already know about the trap loan scheme, they might not, and we explain it to them. If they're happy to participate, volunteer goes, drops them off a trap, shows them how to use it. The member of public will be responsible for that, and when they catch a grey, volunteer will go out and collect it. So the trap loan scheme enables us to um, the ability to be able to take, uh, have grey control in these areas that we want be able to without it and it is proven very effective in those areas so um i was when i checked mine at the start um we were talking about like race world management across the uk in the future and what may be happening um, there's a lot of research going into the damage from that grace cause and as well maybe the other options for grace squirrel control um, so i'll touch on a few things here but you could definitely do another talk on each one of these. Um, so if it's something that you're interested in, I definitely suggest um, having a look online because there's always talks in these things at the moment, especially with everything being online with COVID and there's usually some really interesting things happening. But I'll touch upon it briefly. So the issue with grey squirrels is that they're seen as a pest to our woodlands. Uh, grey squirrels cause damage to trees through bark stripping. So they'll strip the bark of the young trees um, and this will damage the tissues responsible for the movement of sugars around the tree. And if this is damaged, it's going to impact the function of the tree. Um, the damage they cause leaves the trees susceptible to um, fungal infections and as well, they can also kill these trees. Um, so in a recent, recently published report by the Royal Forestry Society, they found that grey squirrel damage to trees in England and Wales causes, um, causes at least, I think it's the most probable scenario, costs at least 37 million a year. And this is in the lost timber value, reduced carbon capture, damage mitigation, and as well at the cost of replacing these trees that have been killed. Woodland creation is at the top of the forestry policy agenda. Um, a lot of councils have these targets to create new woodlands and have planted so many trees by a certain date, but the damage by grey squirrels is a threat to the health and creation of these new woodlands. Um, so there is a want and a need for grey squirrels to be effectively controlled, but also this calls from the public that they want non-lethal methods, which of course is understandable when we have so many greys in the UK and because people see them as our wildlife. So you've got the UK Squirrel Accord, which is fundraising research into a great squirrel fertility control. So this would provide us with a non-lethal control for populations and support the current eradication efforts. The study aims to produce an immunocontraceptive that can be taken orally by grey squirrels through a feeder that only greys can access. So it will be species specific and um, the animal plant and health, Animal and Plant Health Agency is currently trialling different methods to find an effective product. So this is something that's currently ongoing at the moment. Um, research however suggested that fertility control applied in addition to culling is the most effective approach to reducing the grey squirrel populations. So it may not be a completely non-lethal solution, but it would definitely help. So fingers crossed for the trials that are going ahead in there and it'd be interesting to see what comes of it. Um, and the pine martins, there's a lot around this at the moment. So due to conservation efforts and reintroductions, the pine martin is making a comeback in the UK. 
and with it there's hope that they may be able to help boost red squirrel populations by controlling greys. In areas where the pine martin have recovered, so in Ireland, Scotland, there have been subsequent declines in great squirrel populations, allowing the reds to recover. And um, pine martins will predate on both red and grey, so it, it's they're not just completely saving the reds. Um, but studies have found that they tend to eat more greys than they do red, and this is probably due to the availability. We've got a lot of greys around, and they're a much bigger animal as well. Um, so it's probably due to that. Um, but as well, red squirrels have evolved with the threat of predation from pine martins, whereas greys haven't. Greys have come here and they haven't got, they haven't had this predator, they haven't had to face it before, and now they're coming across it, they don't know how to cope with it. So reds know to avoid them, whereas greys do not. Um, however, research is still ongoing, there's still a lot of studies going into this, a lot of trials and um, reintroductions happening and population monitoring. So it will be interesting to see where it go. Um, but unfortunately for us, um, pine martins have been found to avoid urban areas. So it may, it's not going to be applicable to the gardens of Formby, unfortunately, but it's definitely something to be watching for. So usually now I would talk about the events that we do, but of course in the COVID world, unfortunately they're all on hold um, for well, who knows how long, but hopefully we'll get back to them one day. Um, but we engage with the public online. One of the things we really encourage people to do and engage with the project is reporting what they see. Um, so we encourage the public to report the red and grey squirrel sightings. This helps with monitor populations. Also, people will get in touch with us with greys and we can then come up with our trap loan scheme. Um, as well, we want to know if people are finding sick and dead red squirrels because this will help us monitor disease. Um, if people find um, a sick squirrel, we will ask them um, to, if it's well, if they find a dead squirrel, we'll ask them, did it adhere to have any signs of disease? If they say yes, we will go out and collect it um, and then we can have it analysed to see what we're dealing with. Um, as well, red orphans, we're coming up to kittens now, so we will get orphans and we will end up hand rearing them, which ends up into a bit of a crash situation. Um, one of my colleagues, Rachel, she has now hand reared about 20 red squirrels over the years. Um, so after, if mum will give birth to about three to four kittens, um, litters up to six are possible. The, the blind hairless kits will be entirely dependent on mum until they are weaned, which is about seven to ten weeks. Um, and they won't be independent till about ten to sixteen. But this is one of our rescues from 2019. This is Ainsley Dale. Um, he was found at Ainsdale National Nature Reserve. And he was found on the ground, he's freezing cold, bless him, and his eyes were still closed, so he was still very young. Um, but he was, as you can see, he's doing quite well here, and um, he was successfully released back to Ainsdale. As well, one of our rescues from last year is Flick. Um, she was found in a garden in Hightown and raised by my colleague Rachel. So our aim is any juveniles we take in will be released back to the wild. Um, but before we do that, they will go into a soft release pen here. So these are built by our staff and volunteers. And basically it's a way of helping the, the juveniles adjust. We're not just throwing them out. Giving them some time to adjust. They learn how to climb the trees. They learn how to forage. Um, eventually the latch over here will be opened. Um, and they can come and go as they please so they can venture at their own time um, and eventually one day they'll just stop coming back they'll stop coming back home and they'll go off in the big wide world and um, so yeah that's how we get our juveniles reintroduced which is always nice to see so when it comes to disease outbreaks um we really need to find carcasses in order to confirm what disease we're dealing with and as well, um, if it's infectious, such as pox, we want to remove those bodies from the environment because they can still be infecting others. So this is where our red squirrel detection dog, Max, comes into play. He's a conservation dog. He was previously trained on explosives, so he's used to being a sniffer dog. 
but he's now been retrained to locate sick and dead red squirrels. Um, previously volunteers had spent many man hours searching for carcasses, but with little success. Um, but Max is able to cover large areas and over rough or inaccessible terrain, and he's saved us hundreds of man hours. Um, he has also been able to confirm pox outbreaks were still ongoing, even after public reports have ceased. So even though it may seem from the sightings that we're safe, he's been able to identify that we still need to be alert of these diseases. Um, so yeah, he's a great asset to have and he absolutely loves his job, but just to show what he can do. Um, so this is one of the areas during our, one of our squirrel pox outbreaks. Um, I think like covering this area for humans is quite difficult, but digging through the undergrowth as well is hard. And as you can see, it is quite well camouflaged, but Max with his nose was able to identify that that was in there. He alerted us, he just passively, he just sits and points, and then we can find them in there. Um, he does this purely driven by the reward of his special ball that he absolutely does. We went out with him last week um, just to train him with a red squirrel sample. And he was loving it. He was absolutely loving it. He loves racing around the woodland, trying to sniff it out. Um, and yeah, this is a reward at the end of the day. And he'll happily take that. And he'll come over to you and be like, oh, yes, I am amazing. And yeah, he is a very valuable member of the Red Squirrel team. Um, so if you'd like to keep in touch with us and see what we're doing, you can find us on Facebook, the Merseyside Lancashire Red Squirrel Project. As well, if you like your regular updates of cute, uh, cute red squirrel photos, you can find us on Instagram as well at lanks underscore red squirrels. And um, we post updates in there as well. But yeah, cute. it's your fill of your cute red squirrel photos. But thank you for having me. I um, covered quite a few things in there, but if you've got any questions, it'd be good to hear. Can I ask a question, Emma? Yeah, yeah. do you want to just um, stop your screen share, Emma? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, am I all right to ask? Carry on. Uh, I had uh, two questions, but you've answered the one on pine marten, so that's all right. Um, but um, the other Rotarians will know that I go to the Isle of Mull quite a lot, and there are no squirrels of either species on Mull. And many years ago, I suggested that, um, looking to the future, it would be a good idea to introduce red squirrels, because there's lots of um, habitat that's suitable for red squirrels, lots of con conifer forest. Uh, and uh, I was told by the people there in, in the Nature Conservancy, I think it was, uh, that under no circumstances would they allow it because there was no proof that red squirrels had ever lived on Mull. And so they would only allow reintroductions and not introductions. But it seems to me as a superb place to have a population that's unaffected by greys. What, what's your take on that, Emma? Yeah, of course. And you know, like it's seen as an opportunity. Um, but I do understand if they haven't had reds previously, you're not sure about the impact on the environment that they're going to have. Um, of course, with island populations as well, you have the issue if you've got a small isolated population. How do we ensure the gene genetic diversity of that population? You don't want to become inbred. So with the issue of small populations, you've also got to consider, to consider the like long, the long term, well, conservation in the long term so you're probably going to want to look at testing that diversity and introducing new individuals to it just to keep talking up that genetic diversity so I can see why they are looking at that and thinking no we don't need them here I mean Scotland are doing very very well in their red school conservation um, uh, we look at them and see what they're doing and they're like right yeah let's let's how can we improve our methods how can we do what they're doing um, so Scotland's doing very well and you've got the Isle of Wight that have got their red schools but they've always had their red schools and they've always stayed safe. You've got Anglesey that recently, well I say recently, a few years ago now, but they've um, 
had their red squirrels back on Anglesey, which is also an island, because that island gives you that added level of protection. But they are still always, they've got their like alerts um, set up. So if people see greys, they're on it on top, but greys are still getting there. So there's always still that opportunity. But yeah, I can see why you see it as a good, but I can also see why they wouldn't want to introduce them there. Okay, thanks. I think Jeff had his hand up. Yeah, the question I had was about a place much nearer to us than, uh, than the Isle of Mull, and that's Gisborne Forest. Uh, it, has ever any thought been given to uh, introducing red squirrels to Gisborne Forest? Yeah, it, ha it has very recently. Um, I was just, I was speaking to the forest ranger, uh, when was it? I think it was last month, um, about the possibility. They're, talk they're starting to talk about it. They're looking at the forest of Boland and looking at what they can do there. Um, so it's in talks. And hopefully, you never know, maybe it could come to something in the future. Thank you. Uh, Michael Parkinson, you have to unmute yourself, Michael. Right, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Right, okay, uh, just following on from that comment, uh, we have recently had uh, red squirrels at Clapham, not very far away from the Forest of Boland. But on another question, why do would it not be better to describe the greys as tree rats? <laughs> and incidentally, if anybody locally, I have a trap, which <laughs> I have not had to use for quite some time. So if anybody wants to borrow one, you'll be very welcome. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I know many, many people who call them tree rats, um, but... I mean, a big issue in conservation is the shifting baseline of what people expect to see wildlife. I mean, the landscape has changed massively. The species that should be are not there. But as you can see how greys have spread across the UK, you can see why people look out and think, oh, yeah, that should be there, because they've always looked out and seen that grey squirrel in their garden. And there are a lot of people who really fight for the right for greys to stay and you can understand why they do that and it is really hard especially when there are a lot of, I mean there's so many cute photographs of squirrels out there isn't there and there are so many parks where you're encouraged to feed the greys and it's really really hard to explain to people no they shouldn't be here and they cause this amount of damage when they can be like yeah but they're cute and it, it is a really hard preconception the cute is really hard to overcome but yeah, there are many people who call them tree rats. Thank you. Emma, may I just ask you, yes, there used on. to be a group of uh, red squirrels um, up on the foothills of Skidor, just north of Keswick. Do you know if they are still there? No, I don't, I'm afraid that that's, we focus on Lancashire and Merseyside, so I'm not sure if they're still there. No. Um, you can look on your local record centre, they'll be when they will show the last noted. But of course, you've got local groups, you've got a lot of people who are quite keen on get great control and know where the reds are as well. So it's definitely something to look into. There'll be Thank someone you. out there, there'll be someone out there who's keen to find them and I'm sure they'll know. Perhaps I could, I could just add to that, Peter. Um, if you go, if you just Google something like Northern Red Squirrels, um, It'll take you to the whole of the north of England and then you can come down area by area. And if you get into that part of Cumbria and the Lake District, you might well find a, a red squirrel conservation group that covers the Keswick area. And they tend to publish their own data of where they've seen them, and where they haven't. You know, I mentioned this one that's that's just behind me at the moment that comes down into the Ullswater area. And I've been on that website and you can actually see where the concentrations of reds are in that area. But I think a lot depends on how successful they have been in putting these barriers around and the traps around them to keep the greys out, because you can have red squirrels in. And there are some down in the southern lakes, but there are so many greys that unless you have a very effective barrier around them and trap and remove and get rid of the greys, basically, um, the reds don't have much of a chance. But go, if, you, if you want to know, if you're interested, just Google Northern Red Squirrels or Cumbria Red Squirrels Group, and they'll probably lead you to that information. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Martin for a vote of thanks, please. 
Heaven's above me again. Yeah. <laughs> Emma, Emma, thank you very much for coming along tonight. Um, you can see there's a, a number of questions and probably there are many I could be asking you, but uh, I think it, it, it's a subject that so many people in this area are just completely unaware of. You know, I know that, uh, you know, I go out on the golf course in Clitheroe with my golfing mate and a, red, a, uh, a grey squirrel comes trotting along and they say, oh, look at that sweet thing there. And I'm thinking <laughs> if I can only get it in in the reach of my driver, I'll absolutely dispatch it with post haste. So there's very mixed feelings around. But uh, I think you've, sh you've explained to us um, how we are really in a fairly desperate position. And I mean, it's rather frightening to think that if we don't do anything, in 10 years time they could be gone from England completely yeah. and, and, and then we really are in desperate trouble so I just hope that with your volunteers with I think the the, the holding the position at the moment that you have by ring fencing them and trapping greys and removing them from where the reds are but that some of these new initiatives like uh, birth control and pine martins can hope to turn the tide and actually then start expanding into some of the areas that people have mentioned that like Gisborne nice Forest right. and uh, places like that. There are, I'm sure, as you look around Lancashire, many, many areas. And I just hope that, that uh, you know, in, in the years ahead, if you're still in the position, you'll be able to go on the attack rather than always be on the defence. Yeah, that, that would be the, that would, that would be the dream, yeah, to be able to have that viable population. I mean, it, it feels like it, it is a constant battle, um, but we are in a good position with the stronghold in Formby. There's so many people that want to protect it and very passionate about it. Um, and as well, further, further across the UK, there's always talks about reintroductions um, with a number of projects. You've got Nosley now, I'm looking at their estate, and they want red squirrels back there. And as well, with the Forest of Boland talking about it, the council talking about their little population in the Stanley, there's a lot happening. So maybe you never know in a few years' time, maybe you come up back and be like, oh. Well, I do, hope, I do hope it happens, Emma, and uh, best of luck in your project. And on behalf of all the members of our club, thank you very much indeed for taking your time to come along this evening to talk to us. And although you can't hear us, if we... <laughs> thank you, Emma. Yeah, um, there will be a, a, a small token of appreciation winging its way to you one way or another. We'll make sure you get one of our Clitheroe Rotary pens. <laughs> so you can keep, keep your, your notes up to date with a nice smart pen. Um, I missed something earlier. I didn't mean to. So, Tony, uh, do you want to just quickly mention IT skills training? I can't even see if Tony's still with us. Was Tony? I think he, I think he's left. Has he left it? us? All right. It, I didn't mean to miss him out. So I will. He was going to share something about IT skills training, but I'll get him to put it in bulletin. Um, next week's meeting is a business meeting and we've got a couple of new members to welcome hopefully and a, another couple of nice things to do um, so I think all that remains um, uh, Jenny, are, are you sure it's a business meeting because I thought I was down to talk all right maybe maybe it's changed from yeah maybe all right we'll sort that out we'll sort that out talk about the history of the grammar school are you <laughs> uh, uh, yeah but, you know, I've got something else lined up <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think we're at the health centre next week so that makes it a bit easier for me at least so I think all that remains then is the closing toast so Rotary Fellowship and Peace the World Over Rotary Fellowship and Peace the World Over Peace the World Over have a good week, week everybody yeah. see you some of you sooner rather than later at the health centre stay safe and take care Thanks everyone, bye. All that remains then is the closing toast. So, Rotary Fellowship and Peace the World Over. Rotary Fellowship and Peace, and the, peace the World Over. Peace the World Over. Peace the World Over. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah. See you, some of you sooner rather than later at the health centre. Stay safe and take care. Thanks everyone, bye.